Hello everyone, we are the Big Fungus team. I'm Annie and I will be introducing you to the problem and our data. Junho will then describe our model architecture, Alexi will discuss our results, and Matthew will be giving you a demonstration. Let's say you're on a walk in nature. Suddenly, you notice a mushroom. What mushroom is this? To find out, you might search up something like red mushroom with white dots, which will quickly give you the correct answer. However, what if your mushroom was a lot less distinctive, like this or this? Without a shelf in the right direction, it's unlikely that you will find your answer quickly. The goal of our project is to determine the genus of a mushroom based on its appearance. Despite not being as specific as species, it will greatly narrow down the search field. So is our project a poison detector? No. Our model has many limitations and cannot guarantee safety. The main limitation is that our dataset of 6,700 images, found on Kaggle, only contains 9 genera instead of all the mushrooms in the world. We chose to simply assume that all of our inputs belong to one of the 9 genera. So what do we do with our data? First, we did a visual inspection and removed obvious anomalies. Then, as the images came in many different shapes and sizes, we crop each photo to the largest square it contains and resize the square to 240 x 240 pixels, the shortest dimension of all. After, we split the data 70, 20, 10, using manual seed to preserve the test set and train our baselines. However, the classes in the data sets are very uneven, not very fair, which may lead to our model being more likely to choose certain classes for better accuracy without strong reason. Hence, we employed data augmentation techniques to balance the classes. We took the processed images and adjusted brightness and contrast, flipped them horizontally, and added noise and blur. We also did rotations and random scaling, but on the unprocessed originals instead, as these required further cropping. In the end, we acquired 2,000 examples for each genus, each image at most one transform away from either the processed original or the actual original. Note that we split the data set prior to augmentation, so only the training set contains augmented images. Now let's talk about our baseline and main models. For our baseline, we decided to go with a simple ANN and a CNN rather than another algorithm like random choice, which would give us an accuracy of 11% for the nine classes, then compared to our ANN and CNN, which resulted in an accuracy of 30%, making it more suitable for us as a baseline. The ANN is a simple fully connected model with a single hidden layer of 512 models. And the CNN is also a simple model with two convolutional and max pool layers connecting to another FC layer with 1000 neurons in the hidden layer. For our main model, we decided to go with Resident 152, mainly because it did well in the image and challenge than compared to other models such as AlexNet or VGGNet. Another reason was due to its faster training time to get the same results than compared to our next best model, VGGNet, due to its simplicity, where VGGNet has around 132 million parameters compared to ResNet's around 60 million, and also because it would theoretically need only one fully connected layer to get the same results thanks to its great classification performance with just the convolutional layers. And in the end, after training a few runs, we decided to unfreeze the final six layers to help generalize for our classification problem Big Fungus, and also to add one more fully connected layer, which gave us a great boost in validation accuracy. In the end, our final model was trained with the following parameters. And because the validation accuracy was sporadic throughout the entire run, rather than saving at the end of each epoch, we modified the training algorithm to only save the model when a higher validation accuracy was detected during training. You are able to see this effect with our results in the next slides. Now we are moving on to the quantitative results. These are the loss and training curves for our best model. If we compare the training and validation curve, we see that our model is not overfitting. The final test accuracy was 80.12%. This is a good result, but we needed other metrics to make sure of that. Compared to the baseline that had a 32% test accuracy, it is performing well. But as mentioned earlier, our dataset suffered imbalance. This meant we had to make sure that after that augmentation, it would not only perform well on the genera that had a larger amount of original samples. This is why we construct a confidence metrics allowing us to calculate the accuracy per class. This showed us that the accuracy did not depend on the amount of original samples we had. We also calculated the precision, recall, and F1 score. 
and overall the F1 scores are all above 0.71 for each class, which shows that our model is performing well and that after data augmentation our dataset was still adequate for training. Moving on to the qualitative results, from the previous part we already saw that our model was not picking from the majority class but we want to see how well it detects features. If we take the example of Amanita, they have some distinct features to classify them as the warts on top or the specific stall shape. They do present this dominant red color on this example, however it is not enough to detect them as Amanitas. We see it from those examples who do present the warts and the stalk shape but not the red color. If we input the image on the left, our model is able to predict it is an Amanita with a confidence of 99% or similarly with the Igrosub example at the bottom, it classifies it correctly with a 95% confidence even though this class presents a huge variety of distinct colors. But sometimes our model gets its prediction wrong. If we input the Sulius picture on the left, it predicts it as a Boletus. The two classes both have a very large cap but the stalk on the Sulius is smaller. The image mostly shows in the center a very large cap, which might be why the model is more confident that it can be a Boletus more than a Solius. Overall, this shows that our model is able to detect features. In this demonstration, we're going to evaluate the effectiveness of big fungus when compared to our two baseline models. First, let's grab a few test images that have never been seen before, and let's pass them through the models. We'll grab one test image from each class. As you can see from these predictions, our fully connected and convolutional baseline models both make guesses purely on the most common classes. Meanwhile, our big fungus model consistently makes good predictions, with the exception of one or two mistakes. For more insight, let's look at the confidence with which each model used to make its predictions. As you can see here, big fungus has this nice diagonal geometry to its matrix. Meanwhile, our other two baseline models do not, as they purely make guesses. Now that we know that Big Fungus is an effective model, let's have some fun with it. I wonder what would happen if we sent this image to the model. What do you know? This man's dressed up as an Amanita mushroom. To finish up our presentation, we'd like to present one of our takeaways. Through the analysis of our data, we have found that mushroom species in separate genera can have significant similarities. Furthermore, there is no guarantee that the shape of all species within any one genus is the same. If we were to improve this model in the future, we would switch to a species classification approach instead of organizing a collection of species under one genus. This would allow for a more direct correlation between the appearance of the input image and the class. Thank you all for your time. We hope you enjoyed our presentation, and we'd be happy to answer any questions.